Neil, really a pleasure today to be able to present some selected highlights in advanced prostate cancer. I'm Oliver Sawyer from Tulane, and I'm going to start off by talking about some of the recent data with PARP inhibitors. And uh, PARP inhibitors have been around for a good while, and they've become a really interesting topic uh, through combinations, new PARP inhibitors being tested in clinical trials, and there's definitely an update that I think people need to hear about. This is just a reminder. This is not updated from 2023, but there was a very important trial called the PROFOUND trial, and it showed not only an improvement in RPFS, but an overall survival benefit in prostate cancer. And this was done specifically in men who had homologous repair, um, homologous repair mutations and genes like BRCA1, BRCA2, ATM, et cetera. And so that particular trial has now been having a few updates. And here's one of the updates. And here we're looking at pain and health-related quality of life with the lab prep versus physician choice. And this is typically an Abby ends a switch. And remember, everybody has got a bogus recombination repair gene alterations. And here what you see is that there is some preservation of the quality of life and pain. I could show you a bunch of other slides, but the bottom line is, you know, these are patient-reported outcomes, and these patient-reported outcomes show a benefit of the addition of Olaparib for those with HRR mutations. Now, it turns out that one of the things that's really interesting if you're trying to look and find the HRR mutations is that there's trouble when you go to the tissue. So this is a small part of a large study. So this study published by Maha Hussein demonstrates that when you're trying to get next generation sequencing done and you're pulling from a variety of samples, some archival and some recently obtained, yes, you can submit a sample but the truth is, you don't always get a result. And there are a variety of reasons why you may not get a result when you submit the tissue to try to get your sequencing done. Maybe you don't have enough of, of the pathology there, you know, not enough prostate cancer. Or maybe they try to extract the DNA and they just don't get it. Or maybe when they try to do the extraction and do the sequencing, they just don't get what they need to get. And in this study, only about 57% of the men who were tested actually were able to get informative sequence DNA. So sample submitted does not mean results obtained, and that's very important. Now, this is just a little more detail on this, and I'm gonna summarize a lot of data uh, in a short period of time. Uh, if you have a fresh sample, that's better than an old sample. Guess what? That's not so surprising. And if you use a prostate primary, that's probably not as good as a biopsy of a recent metastasis. And if you have more tumor content, well, guess what? You do better if you have less tumor content. These are sort of intuitively obvious things, but it's nice to really see the data. So the bottom line is, if you're trying to get tissue, you're probably going to do better with a fresh sample from a metastatic site as opposed to an old sample from an archive prostate. And by the way, the age of that archive prostate may be eight years or more, and you're not going to get good sequence data out of that, out of that a significant portion of the time. Now, one of the things that has risen, and this is an important topic, is if you have trouble about getting tissue and getting genomics from the tissue that you have, what about the obvious? What about circulating tumor DNA? And here you have nice data showing that circulating tumor DNA, in fact, works. And we're looking for a BRCA1, BRCA2, and ATM. And that's the way that the profound study was organized. This was their so-called cohort A. And then you can look, if you're just relying on circulating tumor DNA, that you can get the answers you need. And of course, almost everybody you can draw a blood sample from. But by the way, still not everybody has circulating tumor DNA. But if you get the result, it's informative. And that's an important message. Circulating tumor DNA works. Now, new study 
Triton 3, Rucaparib, another PARP inhibitor, just published in New England Journal, presented by Alan Bryce at ESCOGU 2023 in San Francisco, published in New England Journal the same day. So Triton 3 uh, did screening, and what they were looking for is the BRCA1, BRCA2, and ATM. And then there was a randomization as the PARP inhibitor Rucaparib, 600 BID, versus physician choice. And this is important. It could either be docetaxel, it could be abiraterone, or it could be enzalutamide. Whatever the physician wanted to use among those three choices, they would get. So two-to-one randomization and then looking at RPFS. Now, when we begin to look at these data, and this is from the New England Journal article, if you look at the BRCA subset, and it is unequivocally positive. Here you see the, the median progression-free survival, and it's really RPFS, radiographic progression-free survival. You see the Rucaparib is 11.2 months, median control is 6.4. That's an important finding. But go down to the ATM subgroup. The ATM subgroup did not benefit. There was no difference between the Rucaparib and the control group when it came to the ATM subgroup. So I think that's an important message, and that did not come up, come out completely clearly in the profound study. Now, it, it turns out that there were two control groups here. One would be the novel hormones, and the other would be docetaxel. So here you get a chance to break it out and look at Rucaparib versus docetaxel, physician's choice. And guess what? Got a hazard ratio of 0.53. That's a winner for the recaparib. And then you look at the second generation hormones, and that would include either Abby or Enza. And again, you have a very good hazard ratio. In this case, 0.38. So I think this is important. This is head to head, if you will, for recaparib versus tocentaxel. And you turn out in the BRCA patients that recaparib, the PARP inhibitor, is better. I think that's important, and physicians need to know about that. Now, niraparib is another PARP inhibitor, and here we're going to be looking at the Galahad study. Now, this is an open-label phase two. This is not a randomized study. This is taking people who have a variety of amalgus recombination repair defects and looking at BRCA versus non-BRCA. And guess what? Those individuals with a BRCA mutation do better than those who have a non-BRCA mutation. And that's not a surprise to me, because one of the things that we've learned as we've gone through the elaparib and more is that the BRCA is almost uniquely sensitive. And when you go to some of the others, like ATM, CHECK2, et cetera, that you don't find a lot of activity with the PARP inhibitors, in my opinion. Now, there's some subsets about that. And I'll simply say that things um, like PALB2 is important. I guess I, I almost want to apologize when I make analogies to other cancers, but I can't help thinking about ovarian cancer, where, of course, there's all kinds of trials, mainly with the three PARP inhibitors. But uh, the question I want, is there a lot of times you're stuck with indirect comparisons. And so first question is, uh, when you look at these new data with Rucaparib and compare it to what we've seen in the same setting with other PARP, I guess mainly Olaparib and Neuraparib, indirectly, how do they compare? And if you had a choice, uh, any thoughts about which one might be better? You know, I think the Neuraparib may not be as active, and I'll be talking about Neuraparib as we go forward a little bit. I think Olaparib and Rucaparib look pretty similar in my mind. It's hard to sort of choose which one might be better. Uh, I think the elaparib has uh, the benefit of probably more data, other diseases, et cetera. Uh, but I think the rucaparib data is also quality data. So again, not to make the analogy too far, but I don't know if you know all the kind of craziness that's been going on with ovary with this scenario, later line monotherapy, because now the patients are all getting it earlier, but they still have this sort of legacy trials out there, and they've all been cut off by the FDA because of not only lack of survival benefit, but adverse survival. I don't know, have you been following that story? 
Not really, Neil. I've heard a little bit of rumblings about it. But what I'll say is that, you know, the chronic administration of these agents is not always so easy for the patient and not so easy for the bone marrow. And that's one of the cautions, I think, that I have in my own mind about some of the studies that we're going to look at here in a moment about PARP inhibitors being given for a long period of time. I mean, I don't know how it's going to evolve in the prostate space, but, uh, you know, uh, again, in, in terms of uh, what we saw there with uh, ovary, uh, it wasn't clear exactly what the reason was. Uh, you know, maybe there was some MDS, AML element for it, but I think the big thing was the peop- there are a lot of patients without HR de- deficit who got treated, who aren't going to have any benefit, and they're all mixed in. So if you separate it with ovary, if you separate them out, it looks a little different. Anyhow, I'm just it's a huge mess in ovary, but uh, I don't know that that's going to happen with prostate, but just it is interesting. I'm sure oncologists are going to look at this and think about what's going on with ovary. Well, I think it's a really good point, and we're going to be looking here in a moment at some of these combo trials. And when we do, I think there's some questions that are apparent. You know, right now we have an RPFS endpoint, but there's a lot of other endpoints we don't have the full benefit of seeing yet. Okay, please continue. So here we're now going to talk about combination of PARP inhibitors and AR pathway inhibition. And there's a, a variety of preclinical rationales about why you might put these two type of agents together. Uh, ADT can up, upregulate PARP-mediated repair, and then you can have a PARP inhibitor that can help to inhibit that repair. And uh, I won't sort of wax poetic forever and ever, but the bottom line is there is preclinical rationale for putting together AR inhibition and a PARP inhibitor, and that has led to clinical trials. And I'm not going to spend a lot of time going into all the background clinical trials that may have led to this point, but the bottom line is that now we have some pretty large trials, and this data is being looked at and scrutinized now by the FDA. What I'll say is this is first-line metastatic CRPC in the PROPEL study. And by the way, I don't see a lot of these patients anymore because so many of the patients I'm seeing have been treated with the novel hormones either for metastatic disease up front or for non-metastatic CRPC prior to them getting to the metastatic CRPC. So this patient population is nowhere near what it used to be. And bottom line is we're going to be looking at a laparab plus abiraterone versus placebo plus abiraterone. Pretty good sized trial, you know, about 400 patients in each arm. And this is an all comers trial. So the HR mutations were looked at after randomization. In other words, everybody got randomized and then they kind of sorted it all out later. And the variety of endpoints, the primary endpoint was RPFS, radiographic progression free survival or death by investigator assessment. Now. This has been presented in a variety of settings. So we're going to look at sort of mature data that is becoming more mature with the overall survival. And then we're going to be looking at RPFS, which isn't really going to change. First of all, it's a little bit interesting. There was a bit of a distinction by the investigator assessment of the RPFS versus the central review. And I'm not going to say that It's a dramatic difference, but there's a little bit of difference if you start looking at medians with the blinded independent central review, we're going to call that bicker, as opposed to the investigator assessment. And if you look down at the bottom, you end up with a median of 8.2 months with the investigator and a median of 11.2 months for the bicker in terms of the, the median improvement. So the trial met its primary endpoint. And then they started to look at breakdown on the RPFS. And, you know, you see things that are kind of trending toward positive. I want to mention this. And then you look down, there's there's one subset, and that's the BRCA mutated subset. Here the hazard ratio is 0.23. Knocks it out of the park. You got a BRCA mutation, it's like a big win. Now, what happens if you don't have a BRCA mutation? Well, it turns out that the hazard ratio is 0.76. Remember, this is RPFS, not OS. And so you have a movement that is on the positive side, but the BRCA is absolutely definitive, 
and the non-BRCA is not so definitive. And that, and this, by the way, is also true for the non-amalgous recombination repair mutated. Now, this is the newer data. This was just what was presented at ASCO GU. And what you see is that there is a trend toward improvement in the overall survival. Now, it turns out that it did not sort of meet the pre-specified endpoint, but it is close. You know, you're looking at 0.81, but this has taken all comers. And if you begin to slice and dice this a little bit, you know, what you see is the HRR mutated population, which is about 28%. And there you see a hazard ratio of 0, 0. 0.6 range. And the other it's in the high 0. 0.8 range. So there's a difference. If you're mutated, it looks like you may have a survival benefit. And this is almost all driven by the BRCA gene. And you look at the non-HR mutated, and I would not call that a survival benefit. So just for a brief moment, and we've been talking about precision medicine for a long time. This is unprecise medicine in my mind. You're looking at those that are not mutated and giving them a drug that is known and proven for a mutated subset. But I think what we're seeing here is if you mutate it, particularly within BRCA, you're going to benefit. If you're not mutated, at least for survival, I think it is maybe a small trend in the right direction, but it doesn't meet the kind of significance that we would really hope to see. Now, it's another study called Magnitude. And Magnitude sort of took this HR mutated group, and you can see the genes, ATM, BRCA1, BRCA2, BRIP1, CDK12, CHECK2, FIK, HTAC2, and PALB2, and it divides them into biomarker positive with a randomization or biomarker negative in a randomization, okay? And here, we're not using olaparib, we're using nuraparib with abiraterone, and this is the PROP inhibitor that is being looked at. So this is an interesting study. And the first thing is, in magnitude, there's no benefit of niraparib in those without the HR mutation. And this is a composite endpoint of radiographic and PSA. This was presented last year, but I think it's an important lesson and part of this discussion. So what you see here in the non-HR mutated, there is no effect and this aspect of the trial was discontinued in the magnitude study. But now if you come to the RPFS and you're looking at the BRCA1, BRCA2 mutated, and here you can see that there is a clear improvement, a good hazard ratio, 0 0.53, 0 0.5, whether assessed by central review or the investigator. So the bottom line is that the niraparib plus the abiraterone makes a difference for those that are BRCA mutated. I think we're starting to get a theme here, um, and the BRCA mutated clearly benefits. Now, new study, just presented at ASCO GU, this is Talapro 2. And now we're not talking about the abiraterone, we're gonna talk about enzalutamide. And we're not gonna talk about niraparib or olaparib, we're gonna talk about talazaparib. And the first thing to note, I just wanna mention this, that there's drug interaction in which you have to use a different dose of telazaparib than you might use in the non-enzalutamide pretreated patients. So you have to pay attention to the doses and the telazaparib here was 0.5 milligrams. Now the primary endpoint, in this case, they're using Bicker, the Bonded Independent Central Review. Here's the RPFS, and you have a very good RPFS of 0.63. Okay, that's a, that looks good as the primary endpoint. And by the way, we're talking about people with a mixture. Some of these are going to have uh, the BRCA. Some of these are going to be unmutated, et cetera. So in that mixture, you win. Now, the HRR deficient population is on the left side. And this is going to be predominantly driven by BRCA. Hazard ratio is 0 0.46. And the non-deficient is 0 0.79. And again, this is RPFS. So you're getting the trend. And, you know, it's got a p-value there that's positive, um, but we're not looking at the OS yet. What we're looking at with OS is these data, and so far has a ratio of 0 0.89. Now, 
I've been part of these discussions, Neil, and I think that there's an interesting sort of dichotomy. You know, OS is our ultimate endpoint, but RPFS is a primary endpoint. I think we need to look at the totality of evidence. I think we need to look at patient reported outcomes. We need to look at toxicity. We need to look at the rest of the story. It's not just about dots on a scan. You need to try to understand who's benefiting and who isn't. And I'll simply say there's a lot of debate on these topics. I don't have a time to go into all the different parts of the debate, but I think that we're treating patients not scans. And that's very important in my mind. So we need to look at the totality of evidence and ask whether or not our patients benefiting or not. And in particular, since me, I'm just going to speak for Oliver Sarner for a second, I'm doing genetic testing on every single patient, either tissue or ctDNA or both. Is it worth it to treat the patients without a mutation with a PARP inhibitor? That's the question. And by the way, the PROPEL trial is in front of the FDA right now. So kind of summary on the PARP inhibitors just for a brief second. Uh, look, these are uh, not FDA approved in combination uh, right now. Uh, we don't have the overall survival. There's no question in my mind that the BRCA mutated subsets are substantially positive. And what about this RPFS? The FDA is going to decide the FDA is looking at some of these data right now. So that's, I think, important. So just a couple of quick follow-up questions. Uh, first of all, uh, is the issue of platinum ever going to come back to prostate cancer, particularly in the BRCA patients? You know, this is a whole issue, again, an ovary. They have the whole thing with platinum and then maintenance. But, I mean, I assume these BRCA patients with prostate cancer are sensitive to platinum. Is platinum ever going to come back? That's a great question, Neil. And you know, as well as I do, that platinum has no patent protection. So there's no sponsor out there who's trying to take advantage of it. I know that these patients can respond beautifully to platinum because I've used it in my practice. And by the way, you know, sometimes the expensive world drugs are just not obtainable because of copays and other problems that we encounter. So I do use platinum in my practice and in some of these patients. Will it be tested prospectively in trials? I doubt it, simply because the sponsors don't have an interest in doing so. So the other question I want to ask you is if you have a patient in front of you who's presenting without a prior history with metastatic prostate cancer, so hormone-sensitive prostate cancer, classic situation, who's got a BRCA germline, you'll say BRCA2 germline mutation, putting aside reimbursement, as you look at that patient, when would you like to be able to use a PARP inhibitor? You know, I think I'd like to be able to use it up front, Neil, because I know those patients are going to be sensitive. And when we can add the PARP inhibitor to a sensitive patient, I think that's when you get the best benefit. I got a BRCA2 patient in front of me. I want to use that PARP inhibitor early. Yeah, I mean, I, I think that's what I figured you probably were going to say. Not, not that you can do that at this point. It just, it seems a shame that you got to wait until, if, if you have to, if we get to a point where it gets approved, you know, castrate resistant, it kind of seems a little strange to have to wait for that point, but I guess we'll have to do it, huh? Well, there's studies in progress right now, so that right. question is being addressed in trials. Uh, but right now, with the reimbursement and the fact that it is an expensive yeah. drug, you know, trying to be able to prescribe that drug outside of the current indication, I'll simply say it's not easy because of the insurance pushback. Yeah, no, absolutely. It's just a kind of interesting situation right now. I'm, I would imagine those trials, hopefully they'll get reported fairly soon, but I don't know. Well, well you got to identify the patients. That's, you know, that's part of the key. The idea of treating all comers up front, long time part, you know, and I didn't really talk a lot about, you know, the, the toxicity here. You know, it's a brief talk. I just don't have enough time to, to yeah, cover absolutely, everything. Absolutely. Yeah, For but sure. anyway, these are, yeah. th these are all important issues. I mean, they're using adjuvant olaparib now in breast cancer. Adjuvant. I'm, I'm aware. Aware. And, uh, you know, of course, mainly, you know, much more emphasis on BRCA. All right, let's get into the really well, great stuff. Okay. Well, we're going to move over to the Theranostics. 
Uh, you see it, you treat it, and I love it. You know, that's, that's my little slide. Uh, what do you take? You know, a lot of people are trying to sort of understand this. You, you need a, at this point, a cell surface receptor. Okay, you got a receptor up there. And then you have something that'll bind to that receptor. That's a ligand. And then you need a linker and you need a radionuclide. And you typically put the radionuclide on with a chelate. So the idea is targeted radiation. The term I actually prefer is not theranostics, but that's sort of what is out there. The term that I prefer is molecularly targeted radiation. Now, you know, we have the lutetium study, the lutetium 177, PSMA 617, uh, FDA approved, positive study. That's behind us, okay? So now we need to begin to think about looking forward. This is a vision trial that led to the FDA approval overall survival in RPFS endpoints both being positive. One thing that was a little bit interesting, and, and I'm still trying to fully understand this, is we know that as a whole, that when you have a high SUV, and that's standardized uptake value on your PET scan, that you're going to have more ligand binding and more isotopic delivery. And you can see here, for those who had a high SUV, that there was a standout, that these patients' overall survival was really benefited. But if you fell into the lower three quartiles, there was not a lot of difference. And I think this is just an important slide. We're going to be looking at more and more data about you know who benefits, who doesn't. But this was just one little slice that I thought was interesting. Another thing I thought was interesting, this presented at ESMO last year, Andy Armstrong. And if you look at the PSA decline at 12 weeks, you kind of know what's going to happen in terms of survival. And this breakout is either no decline, 0 to 50, 50 to 90, or greater than 90%. Let's just look at the extremes. So greater than 90% is that upward part of the curve. These individuals have a strong overall survival. In fact, this doesn't even hit the median. On the other hand, if your PSA is going up, then guess what? You're not going to do so well, and your median survival here is going to be eight to nine months type thing. So there's a big difference between those people whose PSA decline at 12 weeks and those people whose PSA does not decline. So that's a lesson from, from that one. Now, what I think is also very interesting is in December 5th, the pre-chemotherapy trial was announced positive. The bottom line is PSMA-4 trial with the lutetium-177, PSMA-617 met the primary endpoint for patients who've not been previously treated with chemotherapy. And I think we're going to need to look forward to a future meeting and find out more about that, but it's important. There's another trial out there called Therapy Trial. This trial had come out of the Australian group and ends up, that's Australia-New Zealand group, and by the way, it's a good trial. These are patients who did not have uh, prior cabazitaxel. By the way, the vision, 41% of the patients had cabazitaxel. And they selected their patients a little bit differently. They looked at a, a, a PSMA PET and an FDG PET, both. And then they randomized from lutetium to cabazitaxel. Now, patient selection is different in Australia because they're using two PETs. They're looking for discordancy, and if you look at these patients, say, on the left-hand side, you see the PSMA is essentially negative on the PET scan, and the FTG is positive, or you look at the bracket second from the left, and you see some PSMA positivity, but clearly the FTG is picking up dots that the other ones did not. Those patients were not eligible. So they excluded 28% of the patients because of these scans that we're not using in the United States. Now, so they had 200 eligible patients, and the bottom line is their primary endpoint was revolving around PSA. Their PSAs were better in terms of decline for those getting lutetium as opposed to cabazitaxel, but there's more to the story. When they follow the patients up for survival, after three years, first of all, these are pretty good survivals. But if you look at the median for a cabazitaxel, 
you know, is probably running, you know, why don't we say 19 months? And if we're looking at the hazard ratio, there's no difference. So one of the things I think we need to take out of this is there could possibly be a class effect. I didn't show you the RPFS data, but again, the RPFS data looked better with the isotope, but it, the overall survival was equal with cabazitax on the isotope. So there's a discordance between what you would predict from the RPFS and, what you, and, and, and the PSA declines and the overall survival. There could be a class effect here that's important. And I've always thought cabazitaxel punched above its weight. I was a co-investigator, co-PI a long time ago on the Tropic trial, and cabazitaxel did better than expected. Cabazitaxel is a real drug. Now, side effect profile uh, was very good when it came to the, the PSMA lutetium. Uh, but nevertheless, I just wanted to point out that survival benefit did not vary. So cabazitaxel was fine for these patients. This is different than vision. In vision, 41% of the patients had already been treated with cabazitaxel. And in vision trial, the patients were not receiving the chemotherapy because it was a standard of care plus or minus design. Synergistic opportunities, the radio pharmaceuticals, I'm just going to throw this out. There's some interesting data that's emerging from preclinical models on DNA damage repair pathways. You know, maybe you inhibit it with PARP and then you get the lutetium or ATR inhibition to get the lutetium or ATM or DNA PK. And there's a lot of interesting work going on now. And I think we'll be hearing more about this later. I'm looking forward to seeing the data. There's some rationale for antigen release from radiated tumors, maybe synergy with immunotherapy, maybe not. You know, we've got to learn more. That's all reasonable. And then sequencing radiopharmaceuticals, there's a little bit of data, uh, retrospective data coming out of the RALU study. These are patients who got radium first, and then the PSMA lutetium 177 second. And this is, nothing is randomized here. This is just a, a, basically a look back. It's a patient experience. But what happened is that when you start looking at the overall survival, for the patients who receive lutetium, it's pretty close to what you were seeing in vision. And these are patients, by the way, who are not typical radium patients, 33 months from their first dose of radium. So this is not like the Alcepka trial where you're talking about, you know, the 13, 14 months stuff. These are 33 months. So these are special patients. But the bottom line is, that radium given before the PSMA lutetium did not seem to impair efficacy. Here are the PSA responses on the left-hand side, all patients 42%, and the vision study was 46%. So again, it looks like you might be able to preserve things. Briefly moving over to targeted alphas, this field is really super alive right now. Lots and lots and lots of activity. You see these type of slides to get people really motivated. You know, here you're looking at PSAs of almost 3,000, and they go down to undetectable. By the way, if you look carefully, uh, the patient on the left-hand side in the pre lutetium state has salivary glands, and you look at the late stage, and you don't really see salivary uptake, and that's because you probably ablated the salivary glands along the way. So this is great stuff, but we got to work it out in prospective trials going forward. Chemotherapy, uh, not a lot new, but I'm gonna to touch briefly on what we call the capacity trial presented by Stefan Udard at ESMO. And he took the cabazitaxel 25 milligrams per meter squared, not 20, but 25, and compared it to the cabazitaxel 16 milligrams per meter squared given every two weeks instead of the conventional dose every three. And what did he find? He found, first of all, if you look at the bottom part, overall survival is about the same. But then you began to look at the side effects and the grade threes and the neutropenic complications. When you're giving Q2 week cabazitaxel, you really knock down the neutropenia. It's only 5.1% instead of 62.9%. And these are patients, I think it's just a gentler way of giving the cabazitaxel. And by the way, there are other studies that look at it with docetaxel Q2 weeks that also look good. Docetaxel plus Pembro. Uh, my friend Dan Petrolak presented this at ASCO GU. Nothing 
dead. You don't need to give Pembro and unselected patients in combination with docetaxel. does not make a difference. So those are my highlights. I hope you're able to enjoy the brief overview. Uh, Neil, thank you for giving me the opportunity to cover some of these interesting concepts and some of these controversial concepts. So I look forward to how our readers are going to react and to your questions.